Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome or welcome back, as the case may be. Wish I had something really cheery to talk about tonight, but we're going to talk about the national debt, which is a little bit problematical. But there are several aspects of debt that we do need to take a look at. I mean, there's the ethical component, there are economic aspects to debt, of course, and political. And it's there's going to be a lot of politics today. But let's let's start with the ethics of debt. You know, it goes back to Bible times, and debt was a very, very serious situation. And when you borrowed something, you were expected to pay it back. And why? Well, because it was private property. You know, there's a commandment, thou shalt not steal. And that would include, you'd be breaking that commandment if you borrowed something from somebody and then didn't give it back to them. Now, sometimes there was hardship where you couldn't give it back, and there are harsh punishments for that because there was a great value on the sanctity of property. And, you know, we saw it in the Second Kings where Elisha, you know, is approached by the widow woman with the two sons, and her sons are about to be taken into servitude as as payment of debts because her husband had passed away and, you know, she was without means to do it. And, of course, Elisha was the one who multiplied the, the cruise of oil and she was able to pay off her debts and live on the rest. Um, Nehemiah, when he, you know, was restoring the uh, the walls and the gates of, of, of Jerusalem. He, he kind of scolded the Jews there for practicing usury. And there's a lot of disputes about exactly what usury means. Is it just interest or is it exorbitant interest? But one thing that was real clear, I think, from Nehemiah was that if it gets to the point where you're using your own children, when you're using human beings, as collateral, you've gone too far. And others would say, you know, if, if the Jews had put their land up as collateral, I mean, land was pretty vital to your your economic viability and continuity there. So maybe you shouldn't uh, use that as collateral. So a lot of uncertainties. Um, you know, even, even Jesus, there's ambiguity. Um, you, you've got the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts. And you also have the parable where he compares a rich creditor who forgave the people who owed him money because they couldn't pay back, contrasting him with a smaller creditor who would not forgive the people who, you know, were in great need. So certainly there's a need for compassion. And yet, you know, it doesn't void the property right, but it does say there's, there's more to life than property, and you can make what you want out of that. But remember the parable, too, of the talents. And Jesus said, you know, that's where the one with the most, you know, doubled them. The one with the second most doubled them. And then the last one was afraid of losing the, the, the wealth he'd been entrusted with. So he just buried it in the sand. And when, Jesus, uh, when, the, when the master in the parable came back and said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I just, you know, I, I hid it because I didn't want to lose it. I was afraid. And he was rebuked. And, of course, that one talent was taken from him and given to the one that had the most which is not exactly an endorsement of socialism or the equalization of wealth, but that's a that's another issue. But I, I, I find it interesting that the comment made, and this is Jesus telling the story, he said, why didn't you at least take the talent and lend it out at usury? So, you know, at times it sounds like Jesus doesn't believe in it, forgive debts, and other times he's invoking usury. I don't have the answer for you, folks. I mean, it's a, it's a complex issue. But... Nonetheless, um, the, the idea of debt, the idea of lending, I mean, it's, it's, it's sometimes economically necessary. And there was a strong strain in Christian thought that there was something a little bit dirty, maybe a little bit sinful about lending money at interest. And so the Jews, by default, became the bankers in a lot of these European societies in particular. I read a book some years ago called 1000 AD, and I might have mentioned this before in a lecture about religion, but you know, there, were, there were Christians who, who killed Jews so they wouldn't have to pay money back to them. It happened in 1000 because a lot of Christians believed that that was the, the millennium and that Jesus was coming back to earth. 
And so they wouldn't, you know, they'd get raptured off the earth and they wouldn't have to repay their debts. Great setup. Only problem was 1000 AD arrived and whoa, we're still here. So they, they had borrowed to the hilt, were deeply indebted, were in no position to pay off the debt. So instead of liquidating their debts, they liquidated their creditors. They, 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 they killed the Jews. And there was similar ugly activity in England in the late 1200s under Edward I. And I'm sure there are other cases of this. Uh, so um, for better or for worse, we, we have interest. And, and of course, interest economically is the value of time. A dollar today is worth more to somebody than a dollar in the future. How do you get somebody to give up present consumption? By saying, well, guess what? I'll, I'll pay you for it. You'll have greater capacity for consumption in the, in the future. Um, jumping ahead to the great American experiment, the great American progress, where we became the most prosperous country in the world, around the turn of the 20th century, there was a German sociologist named Max Weber, pronouncing it the German way, W-E-B-E-R, Weber, Weber. And he's the one that hypothesized the Protestant work ethic. You know, he looked at European societies, and at that time, the Protestant societies were more economically advanced than the Catholic societies. And so Weber attributed to a, a Protestant work ethic, which the foundations of which, the, uh, the central tenets of which were hard work, thrift, the ability to defer gratification or the willingness to defer gratification, living within your means and accumulating capital. And it worked for a lot of individuals and it worked for American society. But um, we haven't been able to sustain it. Um, one of my favorite books in recent years, I'm going to give you the, the title, it's called Coming Apart. The author is Charles Murray, who retired recently from the American Enterprise Institute. He came to Grove City and gave a talk six or seven years ago. I was privileged to sit with him for dinner. You know, a really pleasant fellow, but a great scholar. Very thorough, very fair-minded. And in this book, Coming Apart, came out in 2012. He talked about sociological reasons for America having more economic problems. And there were four main pillars of our society that he felt were eroding and that there would be more poverty as a result. The erosion of marriage, the erosion of religiosity, the erosion of industriousness, because indeed we do have, we don't know how many million working age men who are just kind of bumming their ways through, 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 through life. They're able to do that. And so, some with the aid of welfare from the government, some just living with, you know, in dad's basement or whatever. And then the fourth one, let's see, marriage, religiosity, industrious. And the fourth one is honesty. And of course, honesty, well, one honest thing that people do is repay their debts. And yet we've gotten to the point where it seems today that people don't seem to think repaying your debts is all that important. That's perhaps most dramatically visible through this uh, issue with the college debt forgiveness. You know, we have a lot of people that went into tens of thousands of dollars worth of debt, realized that they borrowed more than it was prudent for them to borrow, but expecting to get bailed out by government. And politicians talking like, well, hey, you know, you, yeah, you don't have to repay it. And it's like, you know, if, if, if it becomes accepted that debts don't need to be repaid, I mean, essentially that's an all out assault on private property. You know, there's this lack of respect for the sanctity of private property. You see it in governments that just want to give it here and give it there. And of course, what they're doing is they're playing the game with other people's money. And this is kind of the difference between private debt and public debt. And it's, it's an important difference. Uh, you know, the economics of private debt is, okay, what you're doing is essentially you're drawing future consumption into the present. But you pay a price for that. I interest. Um, people may not remember this, but back when, well, no, mortgage rates are back up. So if you have a 30-year mortgage 
that you pay off at 6% interest, by the time you've finished your payments in 30 years, you've paid more than twice what the sale price of the house was. And every dollar, of course, that you have to use to pay off debt is a dollar that you cannot use, you know, for current consumption. So it's like you party today, you consume today, but you consume less in the future. At least that's, that's the theory. It's been complicated by the issue of inflation. Um, you know, looking ahead here to the, the political aspect, the national debt, you saw the title of the lecture, it's 34 trillion. I, I looked it up yesterday, it was 34 trillion, 225 billion and change. Wish I had some <laughs> change of that amount. But um, uh, you, you can get the current figures. There's an amazing website called US Debt Clock. No periods or dashes or hyphens or anything. USDebtClock.org. And there you'll see a running account. And of course, the, the numbers are multiplying at a rapid pace. But how do you pay off the debt? See, here, it, again, what's different about public debt is you're not making a private decision. Like, I'm putting myself at risk. You're putting your taxpayers at risk. Actually, you're putting future taxpayers at risk. You know, you're, you're, you're going into debt, the government goes into debt today to spend today and says, well, well, we'll pay it back later, which means you'll have people paying taxes for stuff. You know, they didn't vote. You know, today's kids aren't voting for these programs. They're not voting for these politicians, but they're going to be paying the interest on the spending that's done today. And there are three ways a government can settle debts. The honorable way, the optimal way, is to pay back the debt in full with currency that has not lost its purchasing power. In other words, if, if today you borrow $100,000 of purchasing power, then an honest repayment of that debt in the future would total 100,000 of purchasing power, plus of course, whatever the interest would be. The second way a government can repay debt is to pay back in the currency, but in a depreciated currency, a currency that's lost purchasing power. A famous example of that being the U.S. Federal Reserve note. Um, it's lost 97, 98% of its purchasing power since it was introduced back in 1914. I, I looked something up today, 1955, you can get a hospital bed for about fifteen dollars a day. Now the nineteen fifty-five dollars worth about nine cents today in purchasing power. So roughly eleven times fifteen would be one hundred sixty-five dollars. Uh, you're not going to find a hospital bed for one hundred sixty-five dollars, and a lot of that is because of the government plowing billions of dollars into healthcare through Medicare, and Medicaid, you know, big government raising costs. But Nonetheless, the government is paying off its debt as it rolls over debt and it pays off bonds and uh, treasury notes that mature. Every year it does it with dollars that have less purchasing power. So it's, it's not really fully repaying what it, it, it borrowed. And the government has this incentive. I mean, the government's the biggest debtor there is. Other people, though, can can benefit if they know how to play the inflation game. You know, we're a debt obsessed society in recent years. You know, you read repeatedly about new records being set, credit card debt, auto loan debt, college debt, personal debt, mortgages, whatever, corporate debt, and of course, government debt. So it's kind of a weird society because in some ways it seems like everybody's borrowing from everybody. Of course, that's not true. There are some people who are debt free, but there are a whole lot more who just seem to want to, to live on debt. And it can work out well. I'm, uh, I have a cousin who bought a house in the 70s and my uncle thought, oh, gee, she's paying too much for it. She and her husband are paying too much for it. Hey, with inflation, it's, it's worth multiples. Uh, the dollar price, you know, maybe maybe it hasn't gone up in terms of real 
value, but you know it's kept kept pace with inflation. I think the happiest example I've heard of this is uh, my first college roommate's oldest daughter and her husband. They're they're from Western Michigan, but this young couple moved out to California, bought a starter house. The market was going up. They rolled it over into another house. Market went up some more. They rolled it into a third house. When they cashed in on the third house, I mean, they, they hadn't paid it off, but just through inflation and the popularity of living in California, you know, these uh, housing prices just kept going up and up, up. So the third house, they just sold it and were able to come back to Western Michigan and buy a really nice place for cash, no debt at all. So, I mean, you know, my mentor Hans Senholtz would say, never, never take out a mortgage on a, on a house. A house is a consumer good. But in this age of inflation, sometimes you can do pretty well for yourself by, you know, buying these houses and then leveraging them up into a larger house like my friend's daughter did. So uh, there you go. But let's let's get into a little American history here and the politics of debt. Um, our founders are underappreciated today. They really were great. They weren't perfect. They had feet of clay, you know, are human beings, but they had a lot of noble ideals and principles. And one of them is they didn't believe that any government had the right to go into debt and expect the citizens then to pay that debt. Uh, notable exception, war, you know, I mean, if, if somebody thrust a fight on you and you had to fight, okay. And if you had to borrow money to pay the troops or uh, pay for armaments or whatever, well, so be it. But then you did your honest best afterwards to, to, um, to pay off that debt. You know, George Washington, if you read his farewell address when he left the White House after two terms, he warned against debt. Jefferson hated debt. And after his presidency, there's a, a letter where he referred to national debt or government debt as, quote, swindling futurity, close quote, on, on a grand scale or something like that. The, the, the founders, it didn't matter what party uh, they belonged to, early generations of Americans really didn't believe in the, the national debt being, you know, anything just or proper, that it was cruel. Uh, Jefferson came up with an interesting formula. He said, no government should, or no generation, nobody should borrow anything that they can't pay off in 19 years. Why an oddball number like 19? I couldn't begin to tell you, but it gives you the, the tenor of his thought. I mean, that's less than a full generation. You know, We shouldn't have one generation incur debt and expect the next generation to honor that debt to pay it off. That was just anathema to, to the founders. And unfortunately, there were always Things going in, um, you know, the Louisiana Purchase, some conflicts, so go into debt, and then we have peace, and we and the debt would get whittled away. There's only once, you know, we actually had this, so people may not know it. There, it's kind of a trivia question. What president had a national debt of zero? It's only happened once in our history. It was about the first year or the first full year of the presidency of Andrew Jackson. And I know there are people trying to get him off the $20 bill because they don't like certain things about Andrew Jackson. But I'll tell you, he was a hero to the American people. Uh, you know, he got rid of a central bank and he believed in sound money. He believed in disciplined fiscal performance of the federal government. He, you know, he, he hated debt. He did not believe in imposing that on the taxpayers. Give the guy credit. Nobody else got the national debt down to zero except Andy Jackson. The change started to happen in the late 1800s and blame the progressive movement. It, it, it's an ideological movement. It's a change of thought, a change of ethos, a change of values. At Grove City, we had a professor in the late 60s, only for a year or two. His name was Clarence B. Carson. And Dr. Carson was a historian and he specialized in intellectual history, the history of ideas. He wrote a couple of books that were very influential to me early in my study of economics. One was called The Fateful Turn, and the other was called The Flight from Reality. 
And if you go online, the Mises Institute, Mises, M-I-S-E-S, M-I-S-E-S, -E -S, Mises.org, one of those two books you can read for free, the PDF. If you like history, and if you're looking for a greater understanding of what happened, how did we go from minimal debt and a hatred of debt to a lifestyle of debt with $34 trillion accumulated by our, our national government, it starts in the progressive movement in the late 1800s. And those two books by Dr. Carson do a very good job of tracing the evolution of it. But it was a slow process. And more generations went by and the debt never got too big. I mean, it, it swelled after World War I. It swelled, uh, unfortunately, it swelled in the 30s. You know, Dr. Carson called one of his books The Fateful Turn. I think maybe we have in the 20th century a couple of fatal turns, fatal to our system of government, fatal to sound finance. One was the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt, actually started under Hoover. They both panicked because of a downturn in the economy and went on rampant deficit spending. And deficit spending is where the government borrows money today because it's spending more than its tax revenue. So they have to borrow more. It didn't help. You know, the Depression lasted 12 years. One of the ironies was that John Maynard Keynes, the famous British economist, came out with a book in December of 35, General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. And he said, yeah, deficit spending is what you want to do at a time like this. <laughs> it's good for the economy. So all of a sudden, the government is fed this ridiculous notion. And it is. It can't stand up to scrutiny. But there was this, it was like catnip to, to big spending government people because all of a sudden deficit spending becomes a virtue instead of a vice. This is good for this is what you do at a time of, of depression is you have the government compensate. It was called contracyclical policy. You have the government rush in to fill the void from the collapse in, in, in private spending. And really what's needed though are for prices just to readjust but the government deficit spending makes it worse and prolongs the depression. Terrible stuff. Interesting, Keynes came out with a German translation to his book. And he, you know, Keynes was shrewd and he knew how the world worked. <laughs> and he, um, he said, you know, this contracyclical policy, it's called contracyclical because you, at a time of deficits, or excuse me, at a time of economic sluggishness or recession, government should run deficits. But at times of economic boom and prosperity, government should run surpluses. You know, that's a good time to raise taxes and pay off that debt. So you see, so in Keynes's mind, in his theory, this was a system for, okay, you, you compensate both at the low end and the high end of the economic cycle. The problem is at the high end of the economic cycle, when everybody's uh, booming, people don't want their taxes raised. And in a democratic system, the voters get their way, and so politicians don't raise them. So you see, it doesn't, it, it may have a certain plausibility in theory, but it doesn't work in a democracy. And Keynes admitted that in the forward to the German translation of his book. He said, you know, this strategy works better in a totalitarian system where the government doesn't have to worry about the people are grumbling because their taxes are raised. You know, the government is a dictator. It, it, it says, we're, we're going to do this and, and, and the people do it. They don't have a choice. So you can see the, the problem we get into here. Um, and Roosevelt used a lot of that deficit spending not to help the parts of the country that were most in need, but in the toss-up states, you know, he had an election coming up in 1936 against Alf Landon. And early in the year, it looked like Landon was going to win. But then Roosevelt very cagely steered a lot of this New Deal money, this deficit spending, into states like California and Pennsylvania that were, you know, kind of like toss-up states. And all that money going in and, you know, people would say, well, you know, um, I'm on the government payroll, or Uncle Frank is being helped out by that New Deal program. I guess we better vote for Roosevelt. The economy still stinks. I mean, everybody knew 
1936, the economy was in horrible shape. But, you know, Roosevelt's like, taking care of this, this, that. And so that's when American politics really became corrupted, where people started using the taxpayer money to essentially bribe voters into voting for them. I'm, I'm sorry if that sounds too cynical, but I mean, you, you see it today with special interest politics and the armies of lobbyists in Washington, D.C. I mean, why are there so many lobbyists? Because they're able to twist the arms of the congressmen and get them to, to support this special interest, that special interest, or whatever. Even if the government doesn't have enough revenue to cover it, because you can always borrow it. And of course, then you print more money to depreciate the currency, so you pay back in, in, less, in less purchasing power. So we had one fatal turn there in the 30s. We had a second in the 60s when Lyndon Johnson launched a war on poverty. At the same time, there was a war in Vietnam. And of course, you know, war has always been expensive. You look at the history of the national debt, I mean, it, you know, it went up in the war 1812, it went up in the Civil War, went up in the Mexican War, it went up in World War I, went up in World War II. You know, Vietnam, no different, a smaller scale, but still, uh, you know, war is expensive. And fighting a war on poverty is expensive. And this, uh, you know, we economists came up with this phrase, guns and butter. And that was a fatal step taken uh, by our country collectively, you know, that uh, originally, under our Constitution, the federal government had very limited functions. You read Article One of the Constitution, it lists like 17 things, and, you know, maintain the courts, keep us safe from foreign invaders, um, a mail system, maybe some uh, you know, routes from point A to point B, whatever. But I mean, very, very elementary government. Nothing about the government being an economic provider, or helper for the people, you know, channeling aid, bestowing favors or privileges on, you know, privilege, you know, private law, instead of, instead of the rule of law, where we were all treated the same, treated the same, we adopted a Marxian philosophy, you know, take from the rich to give to the poor, redistribute the wealth, you know, the, the rich don't have to do anything bad to anybody, they're just guilty of being rich. And of course, as I've explained in earlier lectures, how do you get rich in a market economy? By providing more value to your fellow man, either through providing a good or a service to your fellow man than, than, than the other guy. It's, it's other oriented. Why punish these people? These are society's economic benefactors. But unfortunately, we um, cease to respect private property and the individuals who did great things with private property. And um, decided we needed to support you know, this business, that business, the other business. Oh, well, if you're supporting businesses, then let's democratize welfare. Let's let's help poor people. Let's help sick people. Whatever. Constant expansion. Um, I wrote an article for Forbes about a decade ago about um, the Pandora's box of progressivism. You know, once you open that box, once you say it is the government's role to take care of us economically. Where does it stop? You know, if you're going to help people with their health care, why not pay for their education? Why not pay for their transportation? Why not pay for their groceries? On and on. There's, there's no limit. It's a slippery slope until basically you've got the government trying to provide everything for everybody, which is, I guess, the definition of socialism. And that's the the slope we've been on, the trend, ever ever larger government, and um, just really, um, you know, kind of tragic consequences, I guess you would say. Let me uh, give you some more up updates on it. You know, after Vietnam and the war on poverty, we still, the national debt as a percentage of GDP wasn't that high. One of the ironies was, you know, Richard Nixon succeeded Lyndon Johnson in the White House, and he had a reputation for being a conservative because, you know, he was an anti-communist, but he increased spending on the social side of things more, than, more rapidly than Johnson had. 
And he gave this famous quote, well, we're all, um, we're all Keynesians now, you know, the deficit spending and so on and so forth. So uh, what we had was the abandonment of any market discipline or respect for free enterprise. The idea was that the government was a major actor in the economy and nothing was going to change that. That was simply the irreversible political reality. And both parties have basically accepted that tenet since then. We, it's like crossing the Rubicon. We, 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 we couldn't go back. Um, even then, the debt, the total accumulated national debt only reached a trillion dollars for the first time in 1982. In other words, it took from like 1788 to 1982. What's that? 204 years? No, 194 years. Six years short of 200. Um, Never trust an economist to do the math. Um, so it took that long to accumulate $1 trillion of debt. And that kind of happened because Ronald Reagan, who's a favorite of ours at, at, at Grove City, but he, you know, he, he made, uh, he dealt with the political realities of the day. He made a deal, uh, a deal with the devil, the devil being that uh, jovial, bulbous, uh, you know, that, 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 that merry Irishman, Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House, Democrat. The Democrats had control of the House of Representatives, which had, has control of the purse strings. And O'Neill said, hey, Gipper, you want to pay for a military buildup? And I think most historians realized that given Soviet aggressiveness at that time, a military buildup was much needed. And it did eventually lead to the disintegration of the Soviet Union a decade later. But it was expensive. And the price that O'Neill demanded of Reagan is that he go along with O'Neill's planned increases in domestic spending. So we went into more debt to win the Cold War, but the price was to expand the progressive sense of government as the economic provider for more and more people. So it got to the point then where in 1992, I remember I was working that summer out at the Foundation for Economic Education, which was up in New York then, now it's in Atlanta, Georgia. Great organization, good friend of Grove City College. Their website, for those of you who want to explore, it's fee.org, F-E-E, Foundation for Economic Education, fee.org. And if you get on their mailing list, they'll, they'll send you a free you know, daily email with a, a couple of articles that debunk popular economic myths. It's a does a wonderful job of educating the public about economic truth. So I'm out there working at Fee and with uh, Dr. Semholtz. I was in after he just after he retired from Grove City College at the age of seven, and he went out and was the president of Fee for a few years. And one of my jobs was to write a weekly editorial. And I remember the the, the editorial I remember most vividly was this was at the end of the presidency of George H. W. Bush, and the national debt had reached four trillion. You know, one trillion for the first time in 1982, four trillion in 1992. I mean, the country had never seen anything like this before. I was alarmed. I thought it was the beginning of the end. I was wrong. You know, economic predictions aren't aren't very reliable. Um, we've kept going, and it just seems to me that the problem's getting bigger and bigger. You know, you hear the the phrase "kick the can down the road." Yeah, I'm. At some point, you get to the debt gets so large that you're never going to repay it. I believe we're at that point now. I think we've passed that point. We're at 34 trillion. That's never going to be repaid. You know what? You think the next generation is going to be so productive that they'll be able to pay for current expenses and retire a 34 trillion dollar debt? I don't think so. But four trillion dollars in, in, in 1992. And then there was some hopeful signs in the late 90s. The Republicans, for the first time in decades, took over the House. And Newt Gingrich, who was a guest at Grove City College just a year or two for the Reagan lecture, still a brilliant thinker, he was Speaker of the House, and he negotiated with Bill Clinton. And depending on who you talk to, the federal government actually ran a budget surplus for either two or four years. I'm in the school that says two years. 
Um, it looked like it in the other two years, but it was only because they counted the Social Security surplus against general revenues. So it's a, yeah, it's a little bit like maneuvering or manipulating the numbers a little bit. But what made that possible? You know, was it, was it an abandonment? Uh, no, it was just a pause in our rush toward bigger and bigger government. Uh, because what happened was you had like a perfect storm in the late 90s, okay? You had the collapse of the Soviet Union. So basically the Cold War was over. We could ease up on the military spending. You know, it just didn't seem to be necessary anymore. So less military spending. You had Gingrich negotiate with Clinton a very major welfare reform in the mid-90s that essentially cut the welfare rolls, the national welfare rolls, like, like in half. I mean, I don't know the exact percentage, but it, it was a huge decrease. So all of a sudden you have people that were taking money and most of them are out there working, earning money and generating revenue for the government. And then you had um, the Roth IRA reform where a lot of people decided to take a tax hit now on current income and put it into a Roth IRA that could accumulate for decades. And when they pull it out, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have to pay any taxes on it at all. They'd get a tax-free um, you know, kitty that they'd saved up for, the, for their retirement. So they front-ended their tax liability. And just the um, stock market boom in the 90s generated a lot of revenue. So you had, you had the confluence of some events that weren't really the result of Democrats and Republicans agreeing in Washington to shrink the size of government. It was just kind of these, these circumstances sort of just fit together in a way where for a few years we didn't uh, increase the red ink. Boy, did that change at the turn of the century. You know, those, those one-time events were over, and then we had 9-11, and we had Bush, who the second Bush, George W., believed in compassionate conservatism. He was the first president since the other Texan president, Lyndon Johnson, to add a federal entitlement because he added Part D to Medicare, the drug benefit to Medicare, which was expensive. And he was, you know, it was guns and butter all over again. Those boys from Texas, they like their guns and butter. And, and I agreed with some of Bush's, I mean, I don't want to get into the whole military thing here. Um, I think we all see in retrospect, it was a mistake to try to do nation building in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, in the early stages, when it appeared that they, they were a, a serious threat to America and American interests, I, you can make a real good case we should have gone in there. But then once we like, you know, captured Saddam and got rid of the Taliban, we should have just pulled out. But we stayed there, and that was very expensive. And then you elected Obama, who was, you know, he's the ultimate um, progressive, except maybe for Biden. And, and he, he was just, you know, spending like, uh, like, 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 like crazy there. Um, but the thing that's interesting is, you know, well, are, are, some people say, well, the Republicans are the answer to the fiscal situation. And, and look, I'm, I'm not trying to take sides here politically. And I don't like the laziness where some people just get so mad, they just say, oh, there's no difference between Republicans and Democrats. There are differences. But neither one is willing to cut spending. Uh, both George W. and Donald Trump had, for a couple of years of their presidency, a Republican Congress. So you had you know, unified Republican control of Washington. Well, guess what happened to the national debt during that time of Republican rule? The, deficit, the annual deficits went up and the national debt went up. So, you know, it's very easy to say, well, it's the Democrats' fault or it's the Republicans' fault. I think it's systemic. I think it's a matter of the whole country, the American people, a majority of the American people having embraced the progressive philosophy that we need big government to take care of us economically, uh, whatever it's got to do, you know, spending, uh, you know, you vote for politicians who will spend and give you benefits. You tend to vote against politicians who say, hey, we need to raise your taxes to pay for all this spending. No, 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 we don't, we don't want to pay taxes. So all the incentives are for the government to spend more, but not tax more. That's how you get deficits and go farther into debt. 
but it's, it's we the people. I, I remember writing an article for Faith and Freedom, oh golly, I bet it's close to 15 years ago now, um, good cop, bad cop. It's the two parties. You know, the one guy plays the nice sympathetic cop, the other guy plays the, you know, the rough guy, I'm gonna get you. You know, that's the Democrats and the Republicans when it comes to spending, but it's systemic. I mean, you know, look, Look in the mirror, American people. Not say you folks, okay? I, I think most of you are probably not big spenders, so don't want the government to be big spenders. But so many Americans do, and it's it's just you know unfortunately the, the, the nature of our of our system now, and we just seem hooked on it. So it was after the turn of the century that the growth in the national debt just exploded. It's increasing. I don't want to say exponentially, but pretty darn fast. I mean, for example, George W., president for eight years, he was the first president to ever spend a $2 trillion budget. He was also the first president to spend a $3 trillion budget. In other words, the size of federal spending went up more than 50% during George Bush's two terms. Ouch. Um, I told you 1982 was the first year that the total national debt exceeded a trillion dollars. In 2011, under President Obama, not one trillion, but 1.65 trillion was added to the national debt in that one year. In other words, the first, what, what did I say it was? 100 and, 194 years of our republic it took to get to one trillion. And then all of a sudden, in a single year, 2011, 1.65 trillion of debt. In a single year, additional debt. Ouch. Um, I mentioned in 1992 that that was the first year that the national debt reached 4 trillion. You take fiscal years 2020 and 2021 combined, the national debt increased $6 trillion in just those two years. And some of it was the COVID blowout. Yeah, but I mean, can we afford that? Add $6 trillion in two years? This is, I'm sorry, folks. This is, uh, this is just Looney Tunes stuff. Can we pass laws to fix it? I don't think so. There was a law passed in 1978. I wrote down its number. The public law 95-435 that declared that by 1981, there would be no deficit spending. Uh -uh. In 1981, there was $77 billion of deficit spending. And then for the next 16 years, there was over $100 billion of deficit spending every year until we had that momentary uh, pause in, in, under the you know, Clinton and Gingrich, Gingrich team working there. Um, laws are, other laws have been passed. There were a couple of laws passed in the 80s about balancing the budget. It doesn't work. I mean, you know, it sounds good. The voters like it. Sounds fiscally responsible, but when push comes to shove, the politicians are going to give the people what they want, and what the people want is more spending and less, phys less fiscal discipline to pay for it. So, it, it's, I mean, in, in 2014, the national debt exceeded 100% of our gross domestic product, and it's like 122% today. And that's just the federal debt. You know, state debt is is more, municipal debt, whatever. Uh, small, much smaller amounts. But, you know, this is a recent development. And one of the things that's ambushing us today is after the financial crisis that ended like in 2009, the Federal Reserve, I wrote about this uh, years ago too for Faith and Freedom, adopted a policy we call ZIRP, Z-I-R-P, zero interest rate policy, where interest rates were crammed down. You probably noticed that in your, if you had a savings account or a checking account at the bank, what they pay you 0.01% you know, interest. I mean, with nothing, essentially. It, it, there was no incentive to save because you couldn't earn any interest. And they maintained that policy for close to a decade. And what happened during that time is because the cost of servicing all those trillions of dollars of national debt. The cost wasn't going up because interest rates were virtually zero. So they just 
rapidly increase the pace of incurring new debt. Well, now interest rates have started to return to kind of more normal historical uh, levels. Uh, Short-term treasury bills, 90-day 90, 90 treasury bills now yield like 5.2% or something, um, which makes sense. I mean, and, and now you can, you know, if you have some savings, you can actually earn some interest on it. Whether there's a net gain, that depends on what's going to happen to the consumer price index. And then, of course, government taxes a little bit of its own interest back. You know, it takes it from you anyhow. But I mean, maybe it can trade wa tread water here or something. But uh, all of a sudden, with the interest rates being this high compared to what they were, historically, 5% is a little bit high, but not horribly high. Um, what's, what, what's happening now is, is uh, interest on the national debt. You know, they have to roll over this debt, but they're paying much higher interest rate than they did a few years ago. And all of a sudden, we're going to be spending, Uncle Sam, the Treasury, is going to be spending a trillion dollars this year just on interest on the debt. So if it gets, you know, I forget what its revenue is just from our personal income tax. I think it's like three trillion. So one of every three of our tax dollars is now being used just to pay the interest on the spending that's already happened in the past. We're not getting any new benefits from that. Uh, and yet the government keeps spending like we're going to keep getting new benefits. And you know, Biden's got these grandiose ideas about you know green energy, this and that. Spend uh, spend on the semiconductors. Spend this. Spend 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 spend. But who's going to pay for it all? Well, we're at thirty-four trillion and counting. The interest uh, interest rates are going higher and higher and higher. Uh, at some point, bondholders are going to rebel. They're going to balk and. Uh, and can you imagine 34 trillion? We were we were only at four trillion, uh, what 32 years ago? Now 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 we're at 34 trillion. It's uh, we were we were only at 20 trillion in 2017. Here we are in seven years. We've gone from 20 trillion to 34 trillion. This is out of control. It's obviously unsustainable. Um, people have a vested interest to kind of keep this rickety scheme going as long as they can. How long can they? I don't know, but it's a precarious situation. And I guess I'd just like to close by repeating a point here that um, it's because of our philosophy of government. It's because we, the people, rejected the constitution that our founders gave us. We've rejected the values that they gave us. You know, they did not believe it was moral to run up debts that would have to be paid by subsequent generations. Today's politicians do it left and right. And again, you know, yes, I'm criticizing the politicians, but on the other hand, in many ways, they're just puppets reflecting the will of the American people. This, these are the political dynamics of our era, and it's awfully expensive, and I think we're gonna pay quite a price for it at some time. And now that I've cheered you up, Let's um, let's wrap this up, and if you, any of you have any questions, uh, I'd be glad to attempt an answer. Hunter, are you there? Yes, I am. So if anybody has any questions, um, they can go to the reactions and raise their hand. Perhaps you're all sensing that there are no, <laughs> no answers. Um, at some point, I think we do have to mend our ways. You know, we just, we've been living in la-la land. And if there's one thing I've learned in the study of economics is that sooner or later, economic reality is gonna assert itself. We cannot live in perpetual debt. We cannot live in a system where everybody's borrowing from everybody else. Uh, we gotta get back to production here in the present. Okay, I see a cliff and a mat. Uh, oh, okay. Who do you want to call on there, Hunter? Um, let's see. Let's ask uh, Cliff first. I think that was the first thing. So I'm going to meet you, Cliff, and uh, ask a question. Cliff, can you hear us? We yep. can't hear you. Okay, there you, there, there you go. <laughs> All right. Your name is familiar. I think I might have had your daughter in an econ class. Yeah, yeah. And I had Sen Holtz many years ago. So Okay. Uh, on some of the same time, but uh, just just a question, you know, the the bricks and different people were trying to get away from the dollar, 
with her own currency and unpeg oil, obviously, which would probably cause it to uh, uh, skyrocket. But what, what's your opinion of that? What do you see with that? And what would it, you know, if the world goes off the dollar now, you know, we're going to be in pretty bad shape. So what's your opinion of all that? Yeah. Uh, I would expect foreign actors to, to do what we should be doing. That's pursue our own interest. And mm-hmm. if they feel that there is a more secure place to park their assets than the U S dollar, then out of their own rational self-interest, they should do that. Um, I kind of wish I had some other choices. I mean, I want my, I want my country to function, so I want a, a, a functional currency here. But we've been shooting ourselves in the foot here for decades, and someday the piper is going to have to be paid. Uh, I do think that if enough foreigners dump the dollar, you, you could see its exchange value plummeting. And uh, I know the isolationists feel that that's not going to make any difference. It's just going to be the U.S. and the rest of the world can just go take care of themselves. Um, historically, I have a lot of respect for the America First movement. I'm just not sure it's really practical in this current era of technological development. It's a, it's a small world. And the idea that we can somehow just, you know, hunker down between the Atlantic and the Pacific, mm-hmm. uh, assuming we close that border with Mexico, you know, I don't think we have to worry yet about invasion from Canada. Although. In the mm-hmm. well, I mean, you know, to, to think that everything's going to be hunky dory and, and we can just ignore the rest of the world it, it isn't viable. And a lot of commerce does need to be international just because uh, where resources are, where different skills are. You know, the international development of the division of labor is, is important. And, um, we, you know, we, we need to be integrated in the world. And, and that requires a, a currency that others are going to accept. And if there's a mass run out of the dollar, I think we're going to be poor as a result. Can't give you any details, but that's that's kind of my general take on it. You're going to be like Germany in World War II? Yeah, that's a big argument. Um, some say that, you know, a global reserve currency can never be a victim of hyperinflation. Uh, I think it depends how you want to define hyperinflation. Can can we lose three quarters of our purchasing power in the dollar? I, I I think it's in the realm of possibility. I will say that we're in many ways we are in uncharted territories. The the world's never been nearly this wealthy before. You know the hyperinflations that have taken place uh, either took place in the past when the whole world was poor, or more recently in countries like Argentina and uh, Zimbabwe. I I, I I did a a lesson last year on money, and I showed you my I have a, a bill printed by the Central Bank of Zimbabwe for 100 trillion Zimbabwean dollars. Uh, that's hyperinflation. Will it get that bad here in the States? Gosh, I sure hope not. Um, do I know? No, I don't. Let me, let me confess ignorance. It's the future. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you. Appreciate okay, that. Perfect. Sure. Great. Thank you. All right, next we're going to have Matt. Hey, Matt, how you been? Good, good. Uh, I thank you for this talk. It, it has been absolutely wonderful. I guess my question, um, and I know you can't see into the future, but from an economist standpoint, you know, as a superpower, we're in a unique situation that we're in a, you know, and I agree with you, we're in terrible shape, except we're the best in the world uh, whenever you start comparing it. The question will be is, will the transformation be manageable and slower in your anticipation and what you've seen from world history, or will it be a very rapid crash type situation, I guess, is is a question that I would have, um, because, you know, if we start having additional cost of capital from other foreigners, that is going to be a sort of a, a come to Jesus type moment. Yeah. Where I come down on this, Matt, is I think it's more likely to be a fairly rapid cataclysmic type of event because I just, you know, there is such political polarization in Washington that there's gridlock. You know, nobody can break away. Even the most conservative Republicans can't. You know, they're not talking about a balanced budget even, um, you know. So there's no consensus on Capitol Hill to reduce 
spending to, to, to mend our ways. Um, you know, I, I just wrote an article recently, the pros and cons of Donald Trump. He did many things his first term that I think were excellent. But as an economist, it bothers me that he pretends that Social Security and Medicare don't need to be addressed. They do. And I'm not saying that for ideological reasons. I'm saying that because of mathematics. I mean, look at the numbers. They don't add up. And unfortunately, Mr. Trump has demagogued this issue and he, you know, he, he uses it against his Republican primary opponents. Oh, she's talking about changing it. Well, you know, she's not trying to rip anybody off. It's the people are, American people are going to be ripped off by Social Security and Medicare because it's been mismanaged. Because Congress has, you know, set it up in a way where it's spent more money than it's taken in. And that's got to be adjusted. Um, I mentioned how... Uh, when Trump and Bush had Republican majorities, deficits went up. Um, Trump cut a deal with very little bargaining with Nancy Pelosi in 2019. He said, well, let's suspend the debt ceiling and uh, I'll, I'll agree to increase spending $320 billion next year above what Obama did in his long-term budget pro projections. Um, he, he, you know, Like I said, he's done a lot of good things. He's not a fiscal conservative. He's got no plan to bring our debt down. Uh, and, and like I say, at 34 trillion, it's never gonna be repaid anyhow. But I just think the paralysis that exists in Washington, it makes it more likely that it's gonna require some sort of a crack up, some sort of cataclysmic event. Maybe it's these different uh, military conflicts around the world. You know, uh, I don't wanna come across like a hawk. I told you, historically, I really like the American first idea, but, you know, it was the United States of America after World War II that patrolled the seas and, and kept them safe for international commerce that gave us the prosperity that we have now. And all of a sudden, you, you know, you got an expansionist Russia trying to conquer Ukraine. And, you know, Putin was on that interview a couple of days ago. So, well, historically, you know, it's, it's no, you got no, his, you got no permanent claim to be superior to the Ukrainian people. I mean, they're willing to die just to get you out of their country, you know. What Putin needs to do is exactly what we made Germany and Japan do at the end of World War II. Just go back to your own borders. Nobody wants to conquer your country. In fact, I think it'd be great if we, hey, we got a deal for you, Vlad. You pull the troops back into Russia, and we'll sign a treaty with you that any nation that makes aggression against Russia, we will join you in, in, in stopping it. All we want there is a secure border. All we want is secure you know, passage on the, on the seas. That requires military might. Can we afford military might? With all this progressive social spending, we can't. That's the thing. See, if we had stayed with the original constitutional vision of government, where the federal government had only a few tasks, but one of those was the military, I mean, yes, I, I'll concede the Pentagon is a wasteful bureaucracy because it's a bureaucracy. I did a lecture on that. Uh, bureaucracies are inherently wasteful, but you need national defense. We probably need more now. Uh, you know, weakness, you know, Washington said, uh, if, if you seek peace, prepare for war. Um, it's our appearance of weakness that is inviting aggression for the Houthis and, and uh, the other proxies for Iran and so on and so forth. So it's like whether we like it or not, other countries are being aggressive. And as Zolzhenitsyn told us in his warning when he spoke to Harvard in 1978, the nature of evil is you dig in, you resist it, you defeat it, because if you just sit back and hope it's going to go away, it won't. It will just grow. So I wish it were different. I wish everybody in the world loved peace. I didn't I wish we didn't have this ag aggression going on, but we do. And if we don't do anything about it, who, is, who will? So I think the whole nature of our world here is at stake at a time of where we're fiscally vulnerable. We've got all of this debt and we're spending so much on so much garbage. I'm sorry, but that's my opinion about like the, the Green New Deal and all, all, all those fantasies, uh, when, when what we should be doing is what the government was always supposed to do, and that is keep the world safe for Americans and, and the free passage of goods. So, uh, gee, Matt, you kind of got me wound up there, and I got a, <laughs> I got a little bit animated, so I um, hope that didn't offend anybody. But uh, I, in answer to your question, basically, I think that some sort of cataclysmic event is probably going to precipitate change. Uh, hopefully it's changed for the better. No guarantees. All right. Does anybody else have any further questions? Can I close with a Bible quote? Romans 
13, 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. The end. It's up to you, Hunter. All right. Well, thank. I want to thank everybody again for coming out tonight. And uh, me and Mark really, truly like to have these lectures. So, again, thank you so much for coming on. And we hope to see you next time. Night. Good night.